Well, welcome to the show, Mike. I believe you're our first astronaut in 17 years. <laughs> really? Yes. Well, I'm very, uh, very happy to be the, the first guy. Uh, it's all it's all uphill from here. <laughs> There's a lot of good astronauts out there, so maybe we'll see who else can join you. But thank you for having me. We thoroughly enjoyed the book, and thank you. I know growing up, Johnny and I had friends who wanted to be astronauts. It was a, mm -hmm. a common thing that kids wanted to be back in the day. Now we hear YouTuber, podcaster, content creator. When did you know that you wanted to be an astronaut? I'm old enough to remember Neil Armstrong on the moon. So it was in uh, you know, July of 1969, I was six years old and I saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And I not only wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to be Neil Armstrong. I, I saw him as, I wanna be that guy, I wanna do that. And uh, all those guys, you know, uh, Mike, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin and then Pete Conrad, Jim Lovell, I, they, were, they were all my heroes, John Young. So I knew all those astronauts like, like I knew baseball players back then. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. I've gotten to know most of them now. So by this time, a lot of them are gone now, too. But, um, but that's what I wanted to do as a little kid. And it, it really made an impression on me. And I knew it was important. But like a lot of kids want to grow up to be astronauts, as you said. But, but it really stayed with me. I thought it was impossible. By the time I was eight years old, I said, it's never going to happen. I, I found out I was afraid of heights about that age. And I still don't like heights. Man. I just hate them. Uh, and I try to avoid them whenever I uh, can. I never thought it could happen. I, my eyesight went bad when I was when I was young. I mean, you know, couldn't see very well. Needed glasses at an early age, and n thought I could never grow up to be Neil Armstrong, which is which was true. But the astronaut program changed when I was a when I was a senior in college. So I kind of forgot about it until I was a senior in college, and I went to the movies and saw the right stuff based on the the movie right stuff so based on the book by uh, Tom Wolf of the same name. That got me thinking again about the space program. And uh, I, I decided at some point after seeing that movie and watching reruns of it on my VCR back then, I realized that either I could just be interested in reading articles about the space program or I could try to be a part of it. Went to grad school with the, with the idea of, of at least trying to become part of the space program. I never thought the astronaut thing would really work out. I don't know if you guys can see these, like my, my patches behind the wall. Yeah. Like every time I see one of my flight patches, I make sure my name is still on it. But some reason it's like, how <laughs> could this have ever happened? But that's what happened. And so it happened as a little kid. And then as an, as an adult, being a senior in college, that I got reignited in that passion. And, and I think it really, though, was what happened to me as a little boy that was always there in my heart and soul and my mind that I wanted to be a part of the space program. Yeah, that opens up uh, the book talking about the eyesight issue. And I remember when I was a young man and I, I, I had some thoughts about wanting to be a fighter pilot. And then I was told, well, you have bad eyes, so you can't do that. So I, so I changed my major into being a rock and roller and was able That's to do that. Bad. But you didn't take hearing that very well. And that opens the book about obstacles and getting over them. Could you tell our audience a little bit about that? But wait a minute, this rock and roll thing's a pretty good thing, too. Do you think you would have, <laughs> I mean, if your eyes were better, you'd be, you'd be a fighter pilot, you think? Or would you have, would you, have you changed over to, to uh, rock and roller eventually? I bet you would have. Well, my dad was a, a rock and roller and they rehearsed downstairs. So there you go. Eventually, it would have been a rock and roll turn anyway. So there you go. All right. So, well, with me, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't uh, talented enough to be a rock and roller, John. So, uh, and I, you know, the other being a professional athlete, that wasn't in the cards as far as the sports that I had tried. So I, maybe there was some hidden talent I had in something else. But uh, no, for for what I, for me, it, as you're saying, my eyesight. So what happened was, is I applied and was was rejected the first time I applied. I just got a letter. The second time I was in grad school at this point. The second time I was almost done with grad school, and they were announced again. So every few years, NASA's looking for astronauts. Still, to, that's the way they do it now. So the next time it came up, I applied again, and I got another rejection letter a few months later. And then the third time, though, by this point, I had gotten my, my PhD, and I was down at the Johnson Space Center working, and they called me in for an interview. So when you're, an, you're a finalist then, and your odds are getting better at that point. You know, it's about 120 people they interview over the court, in groups of 20 over six weeks. So anyway, I went in there with, with, with high hopes, but then I failed the eye exam. Uh, I couldn't see well enough. And and you mentioned the thing about the fighter pilot stuff. That's all. Done. So if any kids are listening or don't worry about it, they threw all that stuff out. That's antiquated stuff left over from a long time ago, like World War II, when you needed to see the other guy when you were flying and whoever saw the other guy first won the fight in an airplane, right? In a dog fight. Now they have all kinds of electronic stuff that 
NASA doesn't even really have a, a vision standard any longer. As long as you're correctable with 2020, LASIK is accepted as long as it's stable. It's a different world. But back then, and this is the mid-1980s, you needed to see well. And when I was told that I was disqualified, what they told me was, is that that's it. You're disqualified and we will not even read your application in the future. So that was pretty disappointing. And I said, was there anything I can do? Because I had heard that sometimes people have something that they're concerned about uh, and they're able to get an operation or get it checked out or provide more data and uh, and get it overturned. And they're like, no, because your eyes are what they are. We don't accept it. I don't even know if LASIK uh, existed. And they're like, you're done. And uh, I thought about it. I was like, there has to be a way around it because they didn't want any medical procedure, any surgical thing done or anything. So um, I found out about something called vision training, which was done with kids, right? It was like a kid thing when their eyes are still developing. If they have bad eyesight, there's things that doctors can. So there was this doctor, like a pediatric optometrist in the, in the neighborhood, more or less, that did this. So I made an appointment to see her and I said, please, I can be really immature. You won't know the difference. Please help me. She didn't think it was going to work, but it, uh, you know, it, it, it did. I was able to pick up a couple lines. It's like training your eyes and your brain to see better. I just needed to feel like at least I could try. I think the way I looked, the way I was looking at it is that as, as long as I was trying, I was okay to, to give up, you know, the first chapter, as you said, the book starts, the first, the first chapters, one in a million is not zero. And I came up with that when I was in grad school, after I got my second rejection was that, Hey, this is impossible. And I said, no, it's not really impossible. It's like one out of a million. One out of a million is a non-zero outcome by definition. I was up at MIT. There's a lot of math going on up there, right? So I even verified this with the math people. And they said, yes, it's a non-zero outcome. But as soon as you give up, guys, right, that one at the end of those zeros turns into a zero and you know the outcome with certainty, you will not be successful. And uh, so that's that to keep, you know, maybe there's a chance. But also, I think looking back on it, it was just to be able to try, I think, a success. Not giving up is, be, is being successful. Once you give up, that's when you're defeated. And I didn't want that to happen. So I was going to do everything I could to figure out a way to, to try to remain in the game. So beyond the eyesight, next challenge is swimming, which I don't think a lot of people would assume astronauts have to deal with in terms of testing to become one. Yeah. How did swimming come up and why was that a challenge for you? Yeah, AJ, just you said that you wouldn't think that you'd need to swim to be an astronaut? Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> well, luckily they didn't. It wasn't part of selection. I mean, I'm glad there was no, you know, all right, everybody jump in the pool. During selection, it was after I was selected. And I think they didn't, they didn't bring it up maybe because they figured they could train us to do that if we couldn't swim, but, or they just figured most people can swim. You know, like it's kind of like, as I say in the book, like making a grilled cheese sandwich. There is some life skills that most people should, you know, probably have by the time they're 30 years old or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I, op I got my packet of information after I was called on the phone that I was going to be an astronaut. And the, the, the greeting letter was congratulations. And in paragraph two was, please practice your swim skills. So I guess they did have trouble with this in the past. And they kind of explained that, that sometimes people come unprepared for the swim test. And you need to be able to pass a pretty rigorous swim test in order to go through water survival training with the Navy in Pensacola. And I, I guess what happened is they were sending candidates down there because you're hired as an astronaut candidate. It's the astronaut candidate program, or as they called us affectionately, ass cans. So I was an ass can at this point. You know, so they're reserving right to fire you within two years for if you, you know for whatever reason. The swim test was gonna was gonna allow us to enter this course with the Navy so we could learn how to survive in the water, get out of an airplane over water with, with an ejection seat aircraft we were going to be flying as a high performance jet the t-38 also we were on the shuttle there was a bailout scenario for an abort wouldn't it be pleasant but if you had to get out of the spaceship you would bail out of it over the ocean so you needed to be able to survive in the water until they would come get you and uh, a helicopter or whatever's coming to get you so that was a course that was required before you could go through the pilot training the the t-38 training and the uh or the shuttle training so it was kind of like the first thing we were going to do. And they they, told, they gave us the requirements. And for me, it was pretty serious. I mean, for most people who can swim, it's probably not that big of a deal. But it was it was a, it was a series of laps, of, I don't know, a couple hundred yards with you. You had to wear like, your boots with and your, and your flight suit and a helmet because that's what you would be wearing when you ejected out of the airplane, for example. And you had to demonstrate these, these survival swims. And then you had to do like a rescue and pull a, one of your classmates, I don't know, for 
50 yards or something so you could keep them alive. You had a drown proof, which is like the dead man's float on your back. And, and then you had a, a tread water for a long periods of time, including at the end, you had to like have your hands out of the water. So I was like, oh man. So it mainly was the, the swimming strokes and all this we had to do that I practiced. And I was feeling okay about it, but I was afraid I was going to embarrass myself. But that the first week of work was mainly administrative stuff. And then on Friday of that week, before we went home, you know, this is the first time our class is all together. Jeff Ashby, a Navy pilot who was our sponsor, he was from a previous astronaut class and he was helping us with our training. He says, okay, Monday, I want to remind everyone Monday, uh, you know, we're going to start your training in earnest and we're going to begin with the swim test. And so I was like, oh, that's great. You know, uh, could it be a math quiz? Could we have something else other than the swim test? But it's the swim test. And then he goes on to ask, who are the strong swimmers in this group? And there was 35 of us just getting to know each other, 35 Americans and nine international astronauts. So we had 44 of us. And, and we had a, a couple of Navy qualified divers who you know, raised their hand. Dan Burbank was a, a Coast Guard guy who was a good swimmer. He raised his hand. So a few people raised their hand. And then he said, more important, who are the weak swimmers in this class? And so I raised my hand and so did a couple of my classmates. And they said, okay, um, everyone else can go home, but the strong swimmers and the weak swimmers stay after class, arrange a time to meet over the weekend because the strong swimmers are going to help the weak swimmers with their swimming. And when we go to the pool on Monday, no one leaves the pool until everyone passes the test. And so that was kind of like my introduction to where things were, is that it was going to be very much team oriented. If you were strong at something, your job was to help someone who maybe might be struggling with something. And if you were having a hard time with something, whatever that might be, you needed to admit that you needed help. And I, I think that was more of the message in some ways that you need to speak up when you need help because what matters is that the team is successful. We all met over the weekend and they, they helped, you know, the strong helped the weak and I was one of the weak and uh, we got to the pool on Monday and all of us passed the test together. So that was my first lesson in what, what the attitude, the teamwork attitude was going to be at NASA. And, you know, that's something that I think applies to, you know, still to my everyday life. I think of that when you're working in a group, you know, you, Hey, you're having trouble, you speak up. How can I help you? What matters is that the team is successful. Well, what we're seeing is the, the data shows that we now feel more isolated than ever due to our working from home and everything else that, that comes with that and, and all the technology that, that we have that we engage with. Uh, it puts us in isolation. And in the book, when you were going over this part, when you recognized that it was that you guys were going to be there with the better swimmers uh, and no one was getting out until everyone passed. Uh, in the book, you mentioned about a, a sense of comfort there, knowing I got this. I, these people have my back and we're going to yeah. be able to do this together. We have to be able to to remember that when we are feeling isolated because of we don't allow ourselves to. It's easy to to spiral thinking that we're completely alone. Yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, John. I think a lot of people feel that way. I, during the pandemic, that was something I spoke a lot to audiences about about feeling isolated. That was similar to the feelings you might have in space as well, that you're out there, especially on a spacewalk, it's you and one other person and you're, all of your support is down on the planet. And uh, I made a, I made mistakes when during my spacewalk. One was really bad. I, I stripped the screw during a repair of the, of the Hubble and there was no backup plan for this because it was such a simple task. Even I couldn't mess it up, but I messed it up. And I remember looking down at the planet. I, before I fessed up, to the ground, I kind of leaned out of the telescope. I was in a foot restraint so I could lean back and take a look at Earth. And uh, we were over the Pacific Ocean and I'm in space and I couldn't even imagine a hardware store I could go to, to get help. And uh, it's like, who's gonna help me now? But I reached out to the Mission Control Center and for, I don't know, an hour, between an hour and an hour and a half, we tried all kinds of things and then they came up with a solution to fix it, which I never thought we were gonna be able to fix it, but they came up with something. And then I learned later about what was going on. I couldn't see them, right? And But it was a guy in a, in a back room in Houston that had an idea. He called up to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland that he did a little test in a clean room. And this is on a Sunday, they're all doing this. And they came back with the results and they just talked about it. So it was like the whole team sprang into action to help me. I couldn't see any of this. And uh, I, I try to recommend to people to reach out to their mission control center whenever you need help. People are still there. They're, they're there waiting to help you, just like you should be there waiting, not waiting, but you know, being available to help them be mission control for others so that when one of your teammates needs something, 
you're there for them. And people should know they can reach out to you and it's not going to be a bother. In the same in the other direction, reach out to your control center when you need them. Don't hesitate. Um, and that, I think, was was a lesson I learned as an astronaut that applies to Earth, but even more so in these times where we don't see each other, but you know the teams are still in place. We just don't, we're not in the same room, just like the three of us are in different parts of the world right now, apparently, and we're still able to communicate. Well, mistakes definitely happen. And you have a story in the book where someone who you look up to makes a mistake in front of you and you're new on the job and now you are re hearing the mistake, but going along with that person's mistake instead of speaking up and how important it is to find your voice in those moments, even if the other person who's leading the charge has more experience, more knowledge and shouldn't be making that mistake. Yeah, that was uh, another thing, AJ, that uh, I thought was important about our culture that I learned early on. And, you know, people can tell you these things, right? You know, oh, you should do this and you should speak up and all that. But, you know, what, what the, the book is a series, there's a bunch of stories to try to help people picture what was happening and how important some of these rules or guidelines are. So we were encouraged to speak up. And for me, what happened was, as you mentioned, it was one of my early training flights in the T-38. And uh, I was flying with a very experienced pilot. And as we were taken off, our heading was changed by the tower. And it was at night, you know, when things happen at night is usually an indication of it just, you know, lose awareness at night. It's always things are more likely to go wrong, I think, when it's nighttime for whatever reason. Can't see as well and you lose some of that awareness. Anyway, so I put the correct heading in the flight computer and we rolled down the runway and my buddy starts turning in the wrong direction. Now, I had about three hours in the airplane at this point. I had my, this was my fourth time inside. I wasn't even sure how to strap in and get the oxygen mask on, you know, and everything. So I, this guy had about 8,000 hours or whatever, you know, thousands of hours of experience. He had, he was a test pilot with the Air Force, Jim Kelly Vegas was his name. And, and he was a combat veteran. <laughs> so I'm like, this guy knows what he's doing. What the hell do I know? And uh, so as he's going in the wrong direction, I don't say anything. And then I was like, I must be wrong. And uh, then the tower comes over the communication loop and you know, over the headset and is like, you know, NASA 922, turn right now, sharp turn right now. And he immediately whips the airplane around. It's a very, very maneuverable airplane, so we're able to get out of the way. What it was is that, unbeknownst to us, another airplane had showed up in the time that we got our initial clearance and the time we reached the runway, and we almost had a midair with a guy coming in to land. And, uh, you know, my, my buddy said, what the heck was that? Did he change our heading? I go, yeah, yeah, I put it right in the flight computer. And he goes, you saw me go the wrong direction? You didn't say anything? And I said, I thought you knew what you were doing. You know, I, there you go. And that was the end of that until we landed uh, about an hour later and uh, we came down the ladders and of the cockpits and, you know, he said, look, Matt, you know, I, I made a wrong turn and that almost got us killed, but you didn't speak up and that almost got us killed as well. You got to learn to speak up. So I, I th that I think is really important. And, and what he, you know, what he said he would have done and what, what I found in further times was that when you're wrong, it's okay to be wrong. It's better to be wrong uh, speak up and be wrong than to stay silent and be correct and then something bad happens and then i never did that again and i was like you know hey especially when you have a close call like that you learn your lesson but hopefully it doesn't take that for people to understand um that it's so it's important to speak up but it's all i think it's more important for the leadership to encourage that you know there was you know there was, and thank you is always a good thing to say in the cockpit is what we would say so if I would have told Vegas, hey, you're supposed to be going to, you know, heading 250, and he'd be like, no, no, they change. He would explain it to me, but, you know, thanks for speaking up. Is Thank you is always a good thing to say in the cockpit because sometimes, especially new people, are going to say things that really aren't correct, right? They may have an idea that's not going to work or we've, we've already tried that, but you don't yell at them. That's not the way it was with, at NASA. It was, you know, you always, you always try to encourage them. So it's, oh, you know, this, we can't do that for this, this, and this reason, but thank you for bringing that up because the next time they might have the good reason. And if you react badly to the bad idea, then you're not going to hear about the good idea. People are going to shut up. I think it was always important, especially for leadership, to encourage that. And that was our culture because we had to be that way or else bad things can happen, like you hit another airplane. But I also think it's a good thing to do in business and in life on earth is speak up when you have a concern and whoever it is that you're talking to should appreciate that you took the, the, the time to speak up and, and thank you even if you're wrong. Mike, during that story, I couldn't help but thinking about all the times that 
that I have been in that position where I should have have spoken up. And usually for myself, what happens in that moment is I, the other person, they make their move and then I start second guessing myself like, oh, well, yeah. they've done this before, so maybe I'm wrong and, and how could I be wrong? Um, and going back and making sure yeah. uh, that I have everything together. And it comes up in the, in the book, in the chapter about trust, where mm -hmm. trust begins with trusting the people who trained you yeah, so that you understand and know these things so you, that then you can now trust yourself to begin to speak up. Yeah, well said, John. Um, thank you for reading the book. That's it's a pretty good synopsis of that whole thing. That was, I, don't, I don't think I could do it better. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's what you, know, you have to remember like in, in, your, in having confidence it's hard you know, for me. It was like, am I ready? I don't know if I'm ready to go to space. My first flight, especially, is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never <laughs> been in space before, and uh, I felt like flying in space was for me. It was like playing in the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever event you can think of is a big deal. You know, a rock star playing in Madison Square Garden or something like that. But I had never even been on a field before or on a stage. I I had to go out there and perform right away. I never been to space, so I trained for hours in the water tank and. And I, you know, I didn't know how I was doing. I was doing okay in the training, but how am I going to be in space? And uh, I was, you know, I was told, hey, you're doing fine. We have full confidence as well. I think the leadership and, you know, some of the people around me were kind of detecting because some of the astronauts, I think, had felt the same way. It's kind of normal to feel that on your, on your first time in space and uh, you're given a lot of responsibility. You don't want to mess it up. But the, the truth of it is you wouldn't be allowed to, I wouldn't, they wouldn't let me go if I wasn't ready. They're not going to roll the dice with the Hubble Space Telescope. They were going to, they had confidence in me. I just need to have confidence in, my, in myself. So sometimes it might be hard to have that confidence in yourself. But you have to realize, hey, I'm, I'm being trained by people who know what they're doing. And that training could be lots of different things. It could be a formal training or it could just be your life experiences or whatever it is that got you to that moment. Um, that, that allows you, that, that you've earned the right to be there. So trust that training, trust the tools, the equipment that you're going to be using that, you know, you understand how it's going to help you, whatever that means. And then um, whatever the equipment might be, in our case, it was like parachutes and spaceships and so on. And then, and then the, the other one is trust your team. We rarely go into things alone. And related to what we had said before, it's a, you know, a space flight was an open book test. My friend Steve Smith told me that, you know, right before my flight. Remember, if you need help, you ask for it. And that's, that's the way it is a lot of times on Earth. And like as we were saying earlier, it's important to, to know they'll be there for you. And then those things allowed me to trust myself because I was like, what, what do I know? Well, as you said, John, the experts are saying I'm okay and they're not setting me up for failure. And I think that that was certainly the case with the Hubble Space Telescope. They were not going to take risks with that important world asset uh, for me just not to hurt my feelings. Um, but I think that's the way it is even in little things that we might think aren't as big deals on Earth. That, But they could be big deals for us, right? Or Because it may not be the Hubble Space Telescope, but it might be a a pitch you're going to give for a, as an entrepreneur or a big meeting or a proposal or whatever it might be. And you're like, well, what's going on here? Do, am I, am I really, am I going to, am I okay to do this? Just remember those trusts, you know, trust your gear, trust your, your training, trust your team. And that leads you for the big one, which is trust yourself. Well, that brings up a very a big point, which is it takes a lot to build trust. And when trust is there, you are capable of wonderful, amazing things, such as going into space and coming back in one piece. However, as powerful as trust can be when it has been built, it's also delicate and can easily fall apart. And in the story about Columbia, it took years for everyone on that team to, to gain the trust back due to that accident. Yeah. So with that, do you have any pointers of what to look out for so that the trust that you work so hard to build is not subverted or undermined. I think the trust is there in our case with the, you mentioned the space shuttle accident. Uh, as I said, trust your equipment, you know? So I remember walking onto space shuttle Columbia thinking, oh, okay, I know all, I, all the workers are really uh, diligent and I know they worked really hard and that's, this is gonna be okay. Well, on the next flight at Columbia, it didn't work out that well. They took some debris on the way up from the external tank foam that came off and they didn't, it, it put a hole in the wing that no one knew about. And we ended up losing the crew on the vehicle. That was a bad day when that happened. That was a horrible, worst day of my life. Um, I, I think that, you know, things are going to happen. I, 
I, I don't know if I fully appreciated it at the time when it first happened, but I started to learn of uh, how much people were affected by that who were not astronauts, people who were not in the line of duty, I think took the accident as bad or possibly even worse. They really felt responsible for what happened compared to the way the astronauts might have felt about it. I mean, we lost our friends and this was not a good, it could have been any of us, it, but but I, but I the impression I got from the folks who were in the control center and in the space shuttle program, they felt directly responsible and they felt horrible about it. So they knew that things had to change. And when that happens, it could I, you know, it could have affected our trust in in them with the team and the and the system, but there was no uh, there's no sugarcoating anything, and a full investigation was done, and everyone admitted, hey, a lot of things were were wrong. When you have a, a major disaster like that, it's never one thing; it's a series of things, both technical and non technical, and uh, there's going to be plenty of blame blame to go around, and everyone has to be open to hearing what happened. Everyone bore some responsibility in this. And uh, we are going to stick together as a team to get through this and fly again safely and finish out the things we wanted to do with the space shuttle program. And the way we reacted, it's not that you can't, you can't prevent accidents, but even with your best efforts, bad stuff is going to happen. You don't, no one wanted a shuttle accident to happen, but stuff happens, right? I mean, you never know. It could be a, a pandemic hits and, you know, no, what are you going to do about that? You know, or whatever else happens, things can happen but it's how you react to it. And so I think the way we reacted to it with diligence to make sure that we understood what happened, put things in place to make sure it never happened again. And everyone came together without pointing fingers, throwing people under the bus. And I think that's the way the team should react when it hits adversity. You know, it's easy to be a good team member when everyone's winning and high-fiving and, oh, this is great. But what happens when you have a bad issue, something happens, with the product you're trying to sell or the sales pitch doesn't go well or a pandemic hits or something happens that there's nothing you can control uh, with about it and it just happens. What do you do then? Do you start pointing fingers and calling people names or do you come together? And I'm really proud of the way the team came together. And so we, it, it tested, I think the trust we talked about, but the way we dealt with that problem, I, I, I think built that the team, uh, in such a way to make it even stronger, built up the team to make it even stronger than it was before. I think the powerful takeaway in that is understanding that finger pointing is not only building distrust, but it doesn't serve the greater mission. You know, everyone no. involved in that mission was looking for success, was working hard for success. No one went in purposely making any mistake, whether it was technical or, or human error was involved. And so often, Finger pointing might absolve us from the blame and the guilt, but it certainly doesn't foster a great team environment. Yeah, I, I agree. I am amazed sometimes at uh, sports teams where something happens at the last minute and they blame the person who made the, the mistake. But if the game is that close at the end, if the event is that close at the end, there were a bunch of other things that happened well before that that put that, you know, and I've seen some, I've seen sports teams stick together and not blame the kicker for missing a field goal. And I've seen other stuff where they just say it was this guy's fault and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, and the guy who's saying that is the guy that two minutes earlier did something really bad that caused that set his buddy up that where that mistake wouldn't have mattered if this guy was doing his job earlier. So, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. But I, I don't think that's a good way for – that's not a good way for a team to behave. You can't, you can't do that. that. You have to stick together not only in the good times, but more importantly, in the bad times. I think that's the mark of it. You find out who you are in the bad times, not in the good times. I think that brings a, a good segue into a, another part of the book where uh, it's titled, Well, Things Can Get Worse. And you talk about <laughs> <laughs> Hoot's Law. And yeah. could you tell our audience a little bit about Hoot's Law, please? As a, as a rookie spacewalker, I was training in the pool one day and um, – and I wanted to show everybody how great I was. You know, I'm the greatest spacewalker. And I was the first rookie to, to get a chance to be a spacewalker on Hubble. There were three previous Hubble missions, and he always had a, an, an experienced astronaut who had flown in space before. At first, it was you had to have spacewalk experience. And then he loosened it up a little bit. At least you had been in space before. So I was the first pure rookie that was going to get a chance to spacewalk on Hubble. So I'm trying to alleviate everyone's concerns and show how good I am. 
and moving really quickly in the water. And we're practicing like we would in space, you know, in big giant pool. And, uh, and I, we have a tether that we're, that we, that always is attached to us. It's a safety tether in case we come off of structure, you start floating around. This thing is like a fishing. It's got a tension on it. It's a big reel that's on your side. It's going to pull you in back to safety, but you don't want to rely on that. You know, as you're fl- you know, flipping around and this thing is willing in like you're a fish. So you don't, it's not, but it's there. For, it was a last resort kind of thing. Anyway. So it also is an obstacle, you know, if you don't keep track of it and, I got this thing between my legs somehow, and I'm like, ah, crap, because it's and I'm floating around in the water, and I'm like, this is like really a silly, bad mistake. Let me try to fix it. So I I tried like kicking it and going on my side to get it out from between my legs, and it ended up going like around my helmet, like down my back, around my helmet, and then I see it in front of me somehow, and it's going around and, I, and like moving, and like you know, I was like tangled in this web. And uh, I still didn't really say anything until someone, one of the instructors who's watching this, because there's cameras everywhere, like, hey, uh, Mash, need some help? I was like, yeah, I guess I do. And then my buddy Jim Newman came over and was really impressed with what I was there. If I was trying to do it, I couldn't have entangled myself like <laughs> that. So he kind of moved me around like a giant balloon in the water and, and got me untangled. And then afterwards, he says, how the heck did this happen? I go, well, you know, I had, this, I had one snarl and then I made it a lot worse because I was trying to hide it. And he said, you got to remember Hoot's Law. I go, what's that? And he said, no matter how bad things are, you can make it worse. You know, you don't want to make a bad situation worse. He also said, Hoot Gibson also said, uh, nothing is uh, often a good thing to do and always a good thing to say. <laughs> Anything of that one. And so anyway, but uh, Hoot Gibson was a very wise, a wise person and um, chief of the astronaut office for a while and uh, beloved by everyone. That was a pretty good thing to remember when you make a mistake, it can get worse, no matter how bad it is, you know, and, you know, you think, and, and that happens. And usually strike one could be really bad, but it's not strike three yet. But if you have, when you make a mistake, I mentioned like when I, when I stripped the screw on the telescope, I actually like thought of Hoot's law, like, okay, this is really bad. But if I start losing tools, if I puncture my space suit, if I break something else, there's no chance. I mean, there's no chance anyway with the mistake I made, but it can, even though you think it's really bad, it can get worse. It could always get worse. And usually that, that first thing that happens, it's time to slow down and recruit help and, uh, and not make it worse. And I think that was something dealing, mistakes are going to be made all the time. In space, I made them all the time. On earth, I make them even more often because they have more free time to make mistakes, I think, but I make more mistakes. And, but we had to learn to deal with them in space on earth you think you might but you have to learn to do it on earth too that's the point right is that we're going to mess up and make mistakes here on earth the consequences of another mistake might not be life-threatening like they could be in space but still it's it's uh, could be threatening to your business or your, your work or your family situation too you know we're having conflict in our families even so yeah not hoots law no matter how bad it is it could always you can make it worse it could always get worse <laughs> Well, in reading that chapter, the thing that came to my mind was how we chase perfection. And we also have this idea of mimetic desire, where we're trying to recreate these pictures that are in our minds. And for our clients, they have a lot of very high expectations. It's whether inner expectations that they have for themselves or the expectations from other people that they put on themselves. And... When it comes to Hoot's Law, if things aren't perfect, they get frazzled. And then when they get frazzled, it starts, they start to beat themselves up and then they get frustrated. And that begins a, a, a spiral that can put them into a, a bit of a depression over the progress that, that, that they had made. And I, I think it's very important to understand that a lot of these picture perfect ideas in our mind are, they're fiction. They're made up, and to not yeah. hold ourselves to these these ideas. And w- when I was reading the chapter, it stuck. At least it, it came to me that your ego had gotten the way of I don't want the other members to see that I got this tangled, Absolutely. <laughs> which then put you in a rush, uh, and which made the situation worse. I, and all because there was something there that you were trying to protect, either the picture perfect for your teammates. Right. And the uh, the result was not good. It's slow down, not to make, you know, don't make it worse. But also when you're going back to when you need help, you need to speak up. 
mistakes are going to be made. Some are small, some, you know, little things you forgot to do or messed up the tether snarl space shuttle accident. Some are huge, <laughs> you know, Yeah. but, uh, so some are big, some are small, they, but they're going to happen and you have to be able to deal with them. And, and so it wasn't that you're trying, we were never, I don't think ever, John, I don't think we we're ever trying to reach perfection. I think what we were trying to realize is being able to handle mistakes well. And, uh, cause you're going to make them. And so another thing I write about is the 30 second rule. You're going to make a mistake, give yourself 30 seconds for a regret, beat yourself up and then move on. You know, it's okay to be really pissed off at yourself for making a mistake, but take 30 seconds. And that's all the time you're going to give yourself to, to be, uh, to be miserable because you don't have hours or days to be miserable because that takes you out of the game. And we couldn't do that in space. And I would say the same thing on earth in your business. You can't, you don't have time to, with your family or your business to take a couple of days off to be miserable. But I, I used to do stuff like that. I would be so pissed off at myself when something bad would happen that I would, you know, I'd be on my mind and it would kind of check out. And that's not a good way to, to operate. So I think what we, what we learned um, and still in the astronaut office, the same thing. It was a, Woody Hoberg's a friend of mine who was selected 20 years after, actually 21 years after me, he became an astronaut in uh, 2017. And uh, he was just in town uh, he, we had a downlink with him with my students when he was in space and he came back to Columbia and we did an event together and the students asked him, what, what was the most important lesson you learned as an astronaut? And I, you know, I just let him answer. And he said, I learned how to deal with my mistakes. You don't, you don't have to learn how to make mistakes because no. we all can do that on our own, <laughs> yeah. but it's how to deal with them, you know, and part of it is fessing up. It's, it, I, I made a dumb move, but I need help here or else it's going to affect the mission. You cannot keep it to yourself. You have to fess up. So fess up, don't make it worse. 30 seconds of regret, and let's try to become part of the solution. Well, yeah, I'd like to dive into the the protocol that you have there for the 30-second rule because accidents happen, mistakes are made, things don't go as planned. You have high expectations that you fall short of. And I have seen people ruminate on these for days to weeks, sometimes months, or years. <laughs> yeah. And in the in the book, I was so happy to see it. it's like, hey, we got 30 seconds of regret and we're moving forward. Now, for a lot of people, they're like, well, 30 seconds, that would be great if I can get through that. But what does it entail to move through that 30 seconds? So could you go through that for our audience, please? It's okay to be disappointed with, with your mess up, the thing you mess up. You're going to mess things up. And it's okay to be mad at yourself, but you, uh, you, you to, to wallow in that misery, it's not going to be helpful. And we did not have even a minute. We did not have seconds to spare, a minute to spare. But I would argue it's not just in space. It's on the ground, too. I mean, life is too precious for you to be going through it miserable because of a mistake you made. But I would hear, you know, leave mistakes in the past, let it go, flush it, all these things. But how do you do that? You know, and the way that I was able to, to be able to, to do that, to move on, was this 30 second rule I learned my, my crewmate Megan MacArthur told me about it, that she learned it from CJ Sturkow, who was a Marine uh, pilot in our office. He called it 30 seconds of remorse, where you beat the crap out of you. You made a mistake. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. So you take it and you just really let yourself have it. I'm the worst astronaut ever. Now I'm going to be known for setting back astronomy for years. The textbooks will say we wouldn't know the age of the universe, except Mike broke the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, why didn't I think of a different way to do this task. Why was I cavalier about the way I did it? Uh, they should have never assigned me to do this. I should have just done simple things. They should have never selected me. I'm the, you know, whatever. Don't vocalize any of this, folks. Just keep it to yourself because you'll scare people. Dude, it's an internal rant. <laughs> and it, set a timer for 30 seconds. And then <laughs> when you get down to like four seconds left, just say, I'm never letting that happen again. It's in the past. And we're going to move, we're going to leave it in the past and we're going to move on. And uh, that's what I did when I stripped that screw. I used that and I was you know, on the Hubble and I was like, I, if I ever get a chance to do this, to continue with the spacewalk somehow, if we get around this problem, because I still had a lot of work ahead of me. I had 111 little small screws. Those are the ones we were worried about. And we had backups for those, backup procedures for those. These were big screws that I messed up with. So I was like, all right, the hard part is still to come. So if I can get by this, I am not going to be cavalier. I'm going to make sure I'm seated with the right tool. I'm going to take my time, you know, and all. I just need, I just need redemption. I need, I need a chance. And I didn't make it worse. Got over the, you know, got over it and became an active participant in the solution. And, uh, you know, 
we, it worked. We were able to get around it and be successful that day. I'm really curious to hear with all this training from a young boy having that vision of being an astronaut to then in college to that night before your first launch, first mission, what's going through your head? And then also, what is that moment like when you actually achieve this goal that you had set out and passed through failures, rejections, worked on your eyesight, became a swimmer, everything that you put yourself through to that moment to be up there in space? And how did it line up with what you thought it would, with the movies and, and what we see in media and what you imagined it to be? The being accepted, the, the being accepted into NASA, getting a chance, getting that opportunity, now that's chapter one, right? And, and I think, in, and that's in my, and then the rest of it is what I learned at NASA. So, you know, it was great to get the phone call to be accepted, but then we, we, we showed up there. And I remember Bob Cabana was the chief of the astronaut office, a Marine Colonel, flown shuttle commander, and he was our boss. And he welcomed us and he said something like, we're very happy to have you here. You know, we were all dressed up. You know, our first day of work, we wore you know, coat and tie and everyone's dressed up. So, we're happy to have all of you here. We're thrilled that you're all here. But I want each of you to remember, this is our first day of work from the boss. I want each of you to remember that for every one of you, there are thousands of people who would exchange places with you this morning in a heartbeat. And the only difference between you and them is that you are more fortunate than they are and that you owe it to them and to everyone else around the country or the world to do the best you can with this opportunity. And so that was it. It was like really great to become an astronaut, but we really, we hadn't done anything yet. And we had to put all these principles to work and these things I learned to get that, that flight opportunity like you're describing. So it was kind of like just heads down at that point trying to get there. And the night before I was, you know, very, very excited about the whole thing and, and, and looking forward to it. Got a little worried on the launch pad when I actually saw the <laughs> shuttle was ready to go. It was kind of frightening. It was a night launch and it was, the place is deserted because there's fuel in the tank. And usually it's a lot of bustling activity, but it's deserted and the space shuttle's brightly lit up with all the support structure. Literally, it looks like a real, no kidding. It's going somewhere. It's going to space. Smoke is coming off of it, just water vapor. It's making these hideous noises, like screeches. I think it was the cold fuel going through the pumps. And I looked up and I thought, after all these years of dreaming, maybe this wasn't such a good idea <laughs> looking at that. But that's where the trust came in to know yeah. you got to go inside of this thing. And once I think about <laughs> stuff, is, thinking about stuff is always worse than doing it, right? That's the other thing. You can really psych yourself out. So build up the trust, remind yourself, get in there, and then everything was fine. But it really hit me. I think, AJ, it was on um, my uh, my second spacewalk when I, and it, where I had a chance to, I think, kind of soak in a moment. And it was a kind of a lull in, 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 the, in the activity that was going on. And I was able to look off to the side and just look at the planet. And it was so magnificent. The, the thought that went through my mind is, you know, this is a view from heaven. What a view this is. And then I thought, no, no, it's more beautiful than that. This is what heaven must look like. And I felt that like I was looking into absolute paradise. I cannot believe, can I, I don't think any place could be more beautiful than our planet. And we get to be here every day. What a great place. But just admiring the beauty of the planet, you know, zipping around our Earth at 17,500 miles an hour in my my NASA spacesuit <laughs> with the American flag on my arm. And it was like, holy crap, how did this happen? I think that was my moment that you turned about. I realized that, well, I'm really glad I didn't give up. <laughs> so yeah. that, I think, was the moment where it all kind of came together. And I was so grateful that uh, that it all that it all happened. Because you get accepted. Once you get in, you still haven't flown yet. And you know, you've got to you've got to get on the you know, get on a mission, hopefully, and and get something to do that you think is important, and it never really lets up. But that was where it kind of hit home. That all right, it was this is pretty cool. It was worth it. Mike, is there anything you want to tell the Flat Earth Society? <laughs> nah, yeah, no, find something else to be worried about. I mean, it's got, I got a feeling there's not many in your viewers, are there, that are flat earthers? No, I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, but no. I've seen them argue online. I'm like, I can't believe this is. No, there's so uh, many. Is, I mean, there's a million things to worry about. I mean, really, yeah. uh, why are we worrying about that? You know, no, it's it, the place is round. <laughs> it's very yeah, easy. Yeah, our home is. We have living a round home, not flat. <laughs> You're gonna fall off the edge. I was not even getting into it. I, you know, it's just yeah, nah. Now, was there there anything that surprised you about that experience of being up in the shuttle and and on the mission? 
I think one reason, I, one thing was that I felt I was surprised at how well prepared I was. I, mean, I don't know if that happens to people too. You know, we think something's going to be really, oh, am I ready for this? And then it, you know, the 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 um, the work went, you know, kind of went. Uh, it, it felt now na- even making the mistakes. I mean, because we had worked with the control center, and even though we didn't have that problem before, because no one thought it could I, that I could do that to strip that screw, for example, and other things that happened. We had uh, worked through so many other problems in practice that we just were able to engage it. It's like, you know, going down to take an exam in, in college or high school, something like, oh, this I didn't know this was going to be on a test. But hopefully you're prepared doing other problems and you can kind of apply that same technique. So that's what we did. So I was amazed at, at you know, how comfortable I felt and, uh, and just how beautiful it, it was up there. And um, even though I'd been prepared for that, there's nothing that can really prepare you for the beauty of the earth. They can prepare us to do our work. And and that's what I try to, you know, there's a chapter in a book about being amazed of how beautiful our planet is from up there, but we can engage it on the ground too. You know, wherever we are, uh, you know, you're out there in a beautiful place in California. John's in a, in a beautiful place down in South America now. But, yeah, but, but you know, we're, we're in these, and I'm in New York City and, and there's a beauty to all of it. And sometimes it's natural beauty. Sometimes it's the buildings around us or the people or whatever it might be. And I, I think that it's important to take that that little time out. And so I was surprised by the beauty of the planet that I saw, but I, it, it stayed with me. And we are living in a paradise. I, I didn't know I would react that way, but that, that's the way I felt, that we are so so lucky to be here. And you're now a member of a very unique club, extraordinary club of astronauts. Tell us a little bit about the camaraderie after the missions are over and now at this stage of your career, it sounds like you're interacting with young astronauts and there's training. So what is life after being in space like? It's actually pretty good. Um, uh, I, I enjoy what I'm doing now. I, I, I like telling the story of space and NASA I, I gave me opportunities. I think a lot of my fellow astronauts weren't that inclined to talk to people about what was going on. I mean, it was part of our job, but I, I really liked it. I thought it was a very important job part of it. And I like interacting with people. And now I, I had something that they were interested in finding out about. I mean, you guys are having me on your podcast for yeah. heaven's sakes, right? Because I was I got to do this cool space stuff, right? So it's given me the excuse to be able to uh, to to do things like this, to share these these things. That's why I wanted to write the book, because I'd learned so much in leadership and perseverance and and teamwork. Um, and I was kind of shocked after I left NASA of how much of those rules that we had, these rules of engagement, more or less, the way we operate and the way we took care of each other, how much of it applies to everyday life and especially to business. And I do a lot of, relatively a lot of, of keynote speaking to various businesses and they're, they're having concerns about mergers and teamwork and people working together and and uh, perseverance and dealing with bad news and change and AI and all these things which we had a certain way of engaging the world when, when problems occurred and when new things came up and programs changed and bad news happened and whatever, that it, those rules that we had that worked for us in space because we had to be safe and successful also apply to business. So now I, I enjoy doing that. The book is part of that, of course, and getting a chance to talk to you guys. I really appreciate it. You know, I really like doing that. And I teach at Columbia. So it's been, it's, it's been it's been fun in that in that regard. I do some TV here, and I got so NASA like gave me some opportunities to be on like the Big Bang Theory TV show. Yeah, I got to to be on that a few times, which was cool. And uh, it it just it, it to me it was another way of of being involved with the space program. And uh, you mentioned like the getting to know the the guys who had left. What was I didn't there was a lot. I, I met Neil Armstrong and got to know him when I was an astronaut, and Alan Bean and John Young, some of those old timers. But I've gotten to meet a lot more since I be, since I left. I think what it is is now being like outside, you're kind of jealous of the people that are still doing it. So it's like, yeah, it <laughs> yeah. feels like a different club. You know, it's like, ah, those guys, what do they know? You know, they're spoiled <laughs> now. They don't have to fly a space shuttle. They, they can go to sleep during a launch. There's not nothing. Good. It's all up. That's not true. But, you, you know, I, I think a lot of it is that I, I still like to hear from them. Like I mentioned, Woody and some of the other folks that are still there that I've gotten to know that are friends of mine. I'm thrilled for them. So it's kind of fun to be cheering them on. It really is. And be happy for what they're doing. And also kind of be in this, this kind of like a, a kind of an offshoot of the, because a lot of us are doing stuff like this. You know, a lot of us are yeah. writing books and, and a lot of us are teaching classes. We share, inf- don't tell my students, this, but we share, you know, we share information <laughs> on classes on it. We, we teach around the country and we all try to help each other. It's, 
it's a the reason it's a great club is because there's really nothing we wouldn't do for each other. And that goes even for some of the new folks who I don't know. If they're coming to New York and I get a chance to meet them, you know, they're my brother or sister. It, it doesn't, it, it is no yeah. questions asked. And uh, that is, that is what makes it nice. And I think, again, that those are, those are things that don't have to be unique to being an astronaut. It can be that for any, for any organization that you have, you have this bond between each other and a respect for each other and a love for each other, really, that, you know, I'm going to, this person is, you know, is one of my people. I'm going to try to help them. And so it was there. I used to get advice on how to fly the airplane or the spaceship or do a spacewalk when I was at NASA. Now that stuff doesn't really, I'm kind of curious what way to doing it now. But uh, now we have different conversations about maybe how to teach or, you know, different, uh, different things to write about, whatever it might be, story or you know, speaking or whatever. So right. it's a different, it's a whole different thing, that, but it's, it's still pretty cool. It's just different. I wouldn't say it's better or worse. It's not as cool. <laughs> There's no way. But I knew it. I was up. You know, that was never going to happen again. I don't really know how you can get anything cooler than being an astronaut. But, but it's not. It's not bad being a former astronaut. So, thank you again for stopping by. We love the book. And our last question for each and every one of our guests is: What is your X factor? What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary, Mike? What made me successful? I think really look at the core values. I would say I had a, I have a pretty good work ethic, and I learned that most likely from my, my parents who worked really hard. My, my dad worked for the New York City Fire Department. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, but very smart and was all work, doing something all the time and, and how important it was to do work in service of others. My mom ended up, when once we were grown, she ended up working in a, in a senior center, helping out there. It was always doing something that's in service of others and that work ethic of doing something that's bigger than you, whatever that, working for an organization, working with other people to do something together, um, like, for example, in the fire department or in the astronaut program or in the companies I speak to, it's the same thing. Where it's a pharmaceutical company or a startup or whatever, there's that camaraderie, that that teamwork. Um, so I think that work ethic was important. I think the the perseverance of not giving up, um, always trying that that no matter what, I would keep I would keep applying until this day because my definition of success is not necessarily meeting the goal, but at least continuing to try because that's all that that you can control. And I think the other thing is being a team player is really important. Um, so I'm giving you those three. I, I, I don't, I think that that combination is kind of what we look for in astronauts. And I think that's what also makes people successful in other things. So and not, the not giving up is really important. Success, I've never met a successful person who's never failed. Um, the successful people are those that, never, that don't let failure stop them, right? And there's examples of that. Even those with early su- success or l- have some early luck in order to continue that everything needs to be built organically and a lot of time you see those people really deal with reality in a harsh way because they didn't have to beat those challenges in order to reach that that place it was uh, they had a they were lucky enough to have the lightning strike and then what came after that was is some real floundering and uh it's it, it and it can take a toll on somebody as well yeah, you've got, you can't be brittle. And I see that a lot with my students as well. Because a lot of, you know, students get to, co- they've been very successful in high school. And then some, you hit, you hit walls. I hit walls when I was in, when I was a little kid. Eighth grade was a huge wall, earth science. I got a D in, in earth science. <laughs> Mrs. Cat was like, still what? made it, it was to space. For a marking period. That was, and I made it to space, you know? So I don't know. Mrs. Katz wasn't thinking this kid's going to grow up to be an astronaut. I was like, this, find something else. Maybe work in the deli or something. That, that's a good job too. But, you know, find something else, my kid. Uh, and, uh, but I, you know, that was my first lesson in, in needing to change the way I could do, do things. So I was lucky that I had a lot of failures at an early age. <laughs> you know, I failed a lot. I just Nothing ever worked the first time for me. And that was a blessing looking back on it. Absolutely. Um, because you are definitely going to hit that wall and, and things are going to happen. And if, if you're not, it's because you're not challenging yourself probably, or who knows, maybe you're just really super lucky. Well, that's certainly one of the most valuable lessons from Moonshot. And we encourage all of our listeners to read the book. Where can they find out more about you? You're speaking in the book. My website is MikeMassimino.com. Uh, you can reach out to me there. The book is available just about everywhere that you might want to buy a book. Also, you can follow me on social media. I was the first guy to tweet from space. So you can find me on <laughs> Twitter or whatever they call it now. The thing that used to be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that stuff. You can find me there too. Thank you, Mike. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, guys.